Do I believe her when she admits it or when she denies it? It was a fun evening. We had dinner at a nice restaurant, then decided to go down the stairs a little and go dance at a bar that neither of us had ever been to, Bar Misty Shore. We both worked in a prestigious establishment further from the city center. We heard the drinks at Foggy Shore were fair, the music was good, and the dance floor was big. I never got tired of spending time with her, and tonight was no exception. In fact, it was more fun than usual because she was drinking. She rarely drinks more than two drinks in an evening, but today, she had four. I don't know what made me want to drink that night, but like I said, it was fun. She was a happy drunk, and I was curious to see how her drunkenness would affect our sex that night. I was looking forward to finding out. We both loved to dance and contribute. As usual, when we went somewhere, she was accosted by several men who wanted to dance with her. And again, as usual, she refused them all. As we were leaving the bar, she was struggling with her coat, hit herself over the head with the purse she was holding in her hand, and tried to put that hand into the sleeve of her coat and got upset when it didn't fit. Then she tripped on her way out the door and fell into my arms. I caught her and she looked at me. She stumbled a couple more times, but we made it to the car. You're my hubby, right? She asked as I struggled to get her into the car. I was already starting to think that there probably wouldn't be sex overnight. Yes, that's true, I said laughing. I had sex with Tyler Jones, she said, and giggled. What did you say? I looked at her and she lost consciousness. I took her home and put her to bed. I had undressed her often over the past three years and it never ceased to amaze me how beautiful her body was. She liked to sleep naked, so I left her like that. However, tonight was different. As I undressed her, I couldn't help but wonder if Tyler Jones, whoever he was, had undressed her and put his hands on her breasts or her ass. If she slept with him, did she like it? I barely slept that night, but she slept. She woke up only at noon the next day. I just made myself another cup of coffee. In fact, brood is too strong a word. I placed the small bag in the coffee maker, pressed the button, and coffee filled my cup. I then added some Baileys to it and sat at the kitchen table sipping it. This was my fourth cup of the day. My usual limit is two. Lenny, short for Lenore, stumbled into the kitchen, still naked. She placed her bag in the coffee maker, placed her cup under the dispenser, and stood there waiting for her cup to be filled. When this happened, she picked it up and came and sat on the stool next to me. We sat, lost in our thoughts, and drank coffee. I spoke first. Who is Tyler Jones? What? Who is Tyler Jones? Uh, I don't know. Are you sure? She just looked at me. Why do you ask? I took another sip of coffee before speaking. Because last night, before you passed out, you told me you had sex with him. I what? You told me you slept with him. Andy is my nickname. Andy, short for Andrew. I have no idea what you're talking about. I knew Lenny for almost four years. We've been married for the last three, well, almost three years. I was a bartender, and still am, actually. She was a waitress at the same establishment. I worked there for over a year before she started working. We tried to work the same shifts, but it didn't always work out that way. Sometimes I worked during the days and she worked at night, and vice versa. Shortly after she started working there, she and I had our first date. Less than a month after that, we had sex for the first time and have been doing it at least four times a week since then. I just looked at her. She spoke. Damn it, I was drunk, and we've both seen enough drunks to know they can say anything. And most of what they say is true, I thought. We sat in silence, finishing our coffee. I'm going to get dressed, she said with an important look took both our cups and, as usual, washed them and put them in the sink to dry. I always loved watching her do this because her breasts jiggled when she washed them, and I loved watching her breasts jiggle. In my mind, I saw Tyler Jones holding them in his hands and rocking them back and forth. We hardly spoke that day or that evening at work. Some people believe that living and working together puts a lot of strain on a marriage, but in our case that didn't seem to be the case. Still, the next two days were the same. 
Very little talking, no touching, and no sex. At work, it seemed to me that Lenny spent more time with some of his clients than necessary. But perhaps it was my imagination. Finally, I said, Okay, I've had enough. I either want our life back or this marriage is over. I agree, said Lenny. I'm tired of you looking at me like you're wondering when I'm going to take the next client out into the backyard and sleep with him, so say what's on your mind. Well done. In wine there is truth. What? The truth lies in the wine. Almost every civilized culture in the world has a saying similar to this. Because they have all experienced the fact, Lenny, that from the lips of children and drunkards you will hear the truth. You said, I had sex with Tyler Jones. You had no reason to say that, and I never suggested that you'd slept with anyone else since we got married, but it was clear as day from your drunken lips, I had sex with Tyler Jones. If it was before we got married, it's okay. If not, then we have a problem. Then we have a problem because I don't know why I said it or even if I said it. What do you mean, if you said that? Of course you said it. Why would I pull that name out of thin air and lie about something like that? Tell me why I should trust you, Andy. Obviously, you don't believe me, so it looks like we're in a stalemate, she said. Yes, I think so. The stalemate continued for another week. For the first time since the beginning of our relationship, we did not have sex. We both had cars. Old model cars because we were saving up to buy a house. But I planned to surprise her with a new car for Christmas. That week, due to the impasse, we drove to work separately. On Thursday, when I came to work, I kept expecting her to show up, but another waiter was working at Lenny's usual tables. I called the night manager. Jill, why does Katie work at Lenny's desks? Because she called this morning and took the day off. She didn't tell me anything about it, I said. Maybe you two should communicate better. We were busy, and I couldn't call her, so I waited until things calmed down. I took a break and called her. No answer. Straight to voicemail. It's 9.30 in the evening, and she's not answering her calls. I looked up and saw Jill heading towards me. Jill, Lenny isn't answering his calls. I think I better go home and find out what's going on. That's a good idea. She just called and quit. She said she wouldn't come back. I have to go. I dialed the phone, taking my coat off the hook and buttoning it up to protect myself from the cold air. She still didn't answer. I unlocked the door to our apartment and entered. She wasn't there. During a search of the apartment, it was discovered that some of her clothes and cosmetic bag were missing. It was almost midnight when I called her parents. Any news from Lenny? I asked when her father answered. We have. Where is she? Probably at Charlotte's, Andy. What's happening? I told him the short version. You two better get it together before it's too late. I called Charlotte. She and Lenny had been best friends since they were three years old. Nobody answered, so I left a message. Please ask Lenny to call me. Apparently, the stalemate had been broken and she had taken the first step. I kept going over in my head what I could have done differently and always got the same result. Nothing. She got drunk and said what she said. I think I reacted the way the average husband would react. I lay down on our bed and tried to sleep unsuccessfully. I got up and tried to eat, unsuccessfully. Around mid-morning, I called her brother. Sorry, Andy. The only thing I can tell you is that you really are an asshole. I called Charlotte again. Hello, Andy, she said. Do you have news from Lenny? I have. Do you know where she is? She is here with me. Can I talk to her? Not now, She's really angry and disappointed that you don't believe her. When should I believe her? When does she say she slept with him? Or when does she deny that she slept with him? Don't be an asshole. An asshole? What should I do? Tell me what should I do. You can trust her. Damn it. I just asked you if I believe her when she admits it or denies it. You need to get a grip, Andy, or your marriage is over. Pull yourself together? She started it. She needs to prove to me that she didn't cheat with this guy. How exactly will she do this? I don't know. Take a lie detector test, swear on a stack of Bibles, whatever. I don't care how she does it. Bullshit. Maybe you should prove that she did it. 
innocent until proven guilty, right? But damn it, she confessed. I told you to pull yourself together, Andy, or your marriage is over. She hung up. Maybe you should prove that she did it. That's what Charlotte said. At 11, I called work. Gil wasn't there, but the day manager was. I told him the story and told him I needed some rest. He had already heard some of this from Gil. How much time? At least a week, maybe more. I have a lot to figure out. Well, you and Lenny were scheduled to be moved back to weekdays next week, but we can make do for a while. Take two weeks. We will count this towards your vacation time. We'll find out more if you need it. I'll sort this out with Jill. The first two days I was free, I struggled to make sense of my new world. I tried to call her several times, but to no avail. Maybe you should prove that she did it, I thought. I made a plan. It was a desperate plan, but it was a plan. I went to the library and looked through all the high school yearbooks for the year she and I graduated and the two years before and after. I read every word on every page of every book, looking for any mention of anyone named Tyler Jones. It took me three whole days, but I found three of them. At home, I looked online to see if their schools had reunion committees. They were. They also had biographies of everyone, where they were now and what they were doing. They even indicated where most of them worked. The first Tyler Jones worked in Washington, D.C., so it would be difficult to communicate with him. From his biography, it follows that after graduation, he entered Ohio State University, and immediately after graduating from there, he went to Washington for an internship with some members of Congress. The other two still lived next door. One sold cars, and they called the dealership. I understand that some car salesmen, like some truck drivers, tend to move around town, never staying in one place for very long, so I didn't know if he still worked at the same dealership that was listed in his bio. I was standing in the customer service area of a car dealership listed as Tyler Jones's place of business. One of the mechanics walked by and I asked him if Tyler Jones still worked there. He worked. I then asked the same mechanic to point me to it if he was nearby. It wasn't on the showroom floor. He was outside talking to a potential buyer. I thanked the mechanic and left. I knew I was taking a risk, but I left and came back just before they were supposed to close. I was lucky he was still there. When he left, I followed him. He stopped at a local bar near the car dealership and went inside. I waited a few minutes and followed him. There was an empty chair next to him and I sat down. As befits men in a bar, we started talking. I'm Andy Buckles. I extended my hand to him for a handshake. I watched his face to see if I noticed any signs that he recognized the name. Tyler Jones, he said. We ended up spending a couple of hours talking and buying each other drinks. This continued for two more evenings. They drank and chatted. This guy was polite. I got the impression that he could talk anyone into doing anything. I bet he sold a lot of cars. He was funny, smart, and handsome. I almost liked this guy. I decided that too many nights in a row might look weird, so I stopped for a while. I still had some free time, so I watched the third Tyler Jones, this guy was a TV news producer, but I couldn't get into the TV studio to see him. I made a copy of his prom photo and, like I did with the other Tyler Jones, I sat outside where he was working to see if I could spot him. It was only after nine in the evening on the second day of my viewing that I recognized him. He gained about 45 kilograms, but nevertheless it was him. A car was waiting for him and he got into it leaned over and gave the driver a long, slow kiss. They broke the kiss, then kissed again. The driver then began to drive away. He turned his head to look over his shoulder at the movement. At that point, I eliminated this particular Tyler Jones from my wife's list of possible sexual partners. So, back to talking about the other Jones. During our conversations at the bar, I learned that he had been divorced for almost three years and had two children. The divorce was mainly his fault. He had a drinking problem and his wife got fed up with it, so she kicked him out. He missed his children and did not see them often. He still drinks, but claims he hasn't gotten drunk since he got divorced. He came to the conclusion that he was drunk the whole time because she drove him to it. She was hot and there was sex, but she drived me fucking crazy, so I drank a lot, he told me. He is much happier not being married.
Look at all the people on Andy Griffith's TV show, he said. They were all happy, except one. You know why? They were all alone. The only one unhappy was Otis, and he was married, so he continued to drink. At times I almost forgot who he was. His personality was charming. If he was telling the truth, he had more women than any five men I know, at least according to him. But I still needed to find out if one of these women could be my wife. And if so, why did she choose him for sex? Why did she need to choose someone for sex? There was never any indication that she was unhappy with our lives or our sexual routine. I was certainly not dissatisfied with either one or the other. I certainly knew that she was harassed. Almost every day she worked, but I never had any reason to think that she took it seriously or acted on it. I had enough free time and was ready to return. I called and was told that I was working the day shift and could come back the next day. I worked a full shift and was glad to be back, although I found myself looking around trying to find Lenny waiting tables. I still tried to talk to her, but to no avail. I began to wonder if she was doing anything to help save the marriage. I also wondered if she dated other men. One evening I had the day off, so I sat outside Charlotte's house and waited. Lenny and Charlotte got out, got into Lenny's car, and drove away. I followed them, but got caught in a traffic jam and lost them. I returned to Charlotte's house and waited. They returned about three hours later, loaded with packages. I went out and approached them. Lenny, Lenny, we need to talk. The only thing I want to hear from you is an apology. Otherwise, stay away from me and stop stalking me, or I'll get a restraining order. Lenny, please listen. I have a couple options we can talk about. No, damn it, listen. Apologize or stay away from me. These are the only two options that interest me. With these words, they entered the house. I got into my car and drove away. I was still working during the day and decided to go back and spend more evening time with Jones. He was there about twice as often as I was. I assumed he came when he had no one to go to. Several days had passed since I last saw him, and we greeted each other like old friends. One evening we watched a couple enter. We watched because the woman was simply amazing in every way. If there is an ideal figure, then she had it. If there is a perfect hairstyle, she has it. If there was a perfect dress, she was wearing it. Okay, she's almost got it on. It showed it more than it hit it, plunging front and back, really deep cut. As the old song goes, she was sexier than a $2 gun. Neither of us said anything as we watched them walk over to the table and sit down. When she did this, she crossed her legs, and the slit in her dress exposed her leg almost to her hips. I suddenly remembered how long it had been since I had seen naked legs. I was excited. Holy Mother of God, Jones whispered barely audibly. Amen, I replied. I've been with a lot of women, but damn, she's probably the cutest thing I've ever seen. He called the bartender. Who the hell is she? This is Mike and Vicky Hairston. He is one of those personal injury lawyers you see on TV. From time to time, they come here for a drink or two. He just likes to show her off to those of us in the unwashed crowd. I didn't pay any attention to him because of her. But now I looked and actually recognized him from the TV commercial. Jones spoke. My ex-wife is no slouch, but I've never been this close to having something as nice as this. He nodded toward Vicky Hairston. It started a few months ago. What started? I asked. Yes. I walked into a place I had never been to before. My waitress was awesome. Not in the same class as that Vicky, but cool. My first time there was fine. She and I chatted a little, but nothing more. She was wearing a wedding ring, but that had never stopped me before. Many married women are looking for a stranger. Some of them don't even know it. So I try to help them and convince them that every woman needs another man from time to time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I asked her if she was happily married. Of course, but we never seem to do anything other than work and go home. Sometimes we have dinner and dance, so sometimes, when he works at night and I work during the day, I go out and have fun. As soon as she told me that, I knew I was going to spend the night with her. Women who go to parties alone when their husbands are working are my favorites. Subconsciously, they want to be fucked. It's just a matter of time and opportunity. 
He took a sip of his drink, then continued. When I was there for the fourth time, she agreed to meet for a drink. This drinking date led to other short dates. We had dinner a couple of times. We even went dancing. I think this girl would rather dance than have sex. And when we danced, oh my God. At first this didn't happen, but later she rubbed her whole body against me, and when she felt that I was excited, she began to rub harder. And it was interesting because we were doing the same thing that she said she and her husband were doing, and she seemed completely happy. We have to be careful because of her husband, so we only see each other when they work different shifts. If he works during the day, we see each other then. One day while he was working at night, that shit really got hot. I inhaled sharply. Lenny loved to dance, and we did it as often as we could. We even danced at work when there were no clients. The rest of the staff always watched and applauded. So what happened? I asked. At this point, a couple of other bar patrons began to listen to him. He made no effort to keep his voice down and seemed glad to have an audience. He laughed. One evening we went dancing. I wanted to touch her firm buttocks and all the other parts of her body. She seemed a little friendlier, and we were dancing passionately on the dance floor, so I just walked over and asked her. Asked her about what? Is she ready to have sex? What did she say? She stopped pressing herself against me and thought for a few seconds. I thought I had made a mistake. She looked at me, and I saw that she had made a decision. She smiled. I thought you'd never ask, but we only have about three hours until my hubby gets home. Hubby? That's what Lenny called me. Hubby. This guy was a real salesman. I had a feeling that he could sell anything to anyone and that most of his stories about women had at least some truth to them. I was starting to not like him very much. We almost ran to my car to get to my apartment, he continued. She stumbled as she walked up the steps, and I caught a glimpse of what was under her skirt. I liked what I saw and reached out there. She had panties on and they were wet, man. Then I knew it was going to be a hot ass. She squealed, laughed, and climbed up the steps. Two more men and two women joined his audience. I could understand the men listening to him, but the women surprised me. When we got upstairs, we wasted no time in undressing. When she was completely naked, she stood there and so did I. I was just watching. Every curve of her body was perfect. Her breasts, waist, and hips were perfectly proportioned. I looked at her, but I felt myself getting excited. She slowly approached, swaying her hips and shaking her breasts. God, she was sexy. She put her hands on my hips and slowly knelt down, leaned her head forward, and got to work. When I finished, she stood up and said, Your turn, ran to the bed, and literally plopped her cute ass on the bed. And now, it was my turn to work on her. I heard the other lady say, God, I'm getting horny from this. Almost all the men around us looked at her when she said that. She blushed. Well, it really is. Was he describing my wife? Lenny, like most women, I suppose, loves to be pleased, and she loves to give it back. Even some words sounded like hers, but she whined more. Maybe this guy had some technique that drove her crazy. But I thought I had it done. I reached for my drink, drank it all down, and ordered another. I didn't know if I wanted him to continue or not. He didn't care what I wanted. He was on a roll. After a long time, she called a halt and said that she needed to rest. Me too. My tongue, neck, and back hurt. I brought us both drinks and we lay on the bed sipping them. It didn't take long before she leaned over and started playing with herself. And then she asked to have sex with her. He paused to take a sip. Damn it, look at me. I'm sweating like a racehorse just thinking about it. I was sweating too, but for a different reason. I was sweating, not from excitement, but from nervousness. Lenny used the word Peter when she teased me. She asked, does your Peter want me? It had nothing to do with my size. She just liked the word, and we both thought it was funny. I looked around at the people who were listening to him. Two men were laughing, and one couple was arguing. I heard a woman tell her companion that she could do the same thing that this bitch can do, and the man suggested they go try it. They ran out. One man walked up and patted Jones on the back. Hey, dude, if you're still not sleeping with this chick, tell me her name. Still sleeping with her? Of course I still have sex with her. This woman is too good to pass up. 
This caused a new outburst of laughter and controversy. One man said that no woman is too good to pass up. The woman next to him slapped his arm and said, Really? Well, you just gave it up, asshole. And she ran away with him after he tried to convince her that he was joking. Another guy asked where she worked. Nowhere now. She's on a break, Jones said. Will you take a break? Some guy shouted. Tell me where she is and I'll talk to her. Taking a break? Lenny, as far as I knew, didn't work. Well, where is she? Asked another guy. He looked at his watch. She's with her best friend now. But later in the evening, she will deliver to me pleasure. My stomach jumped to my throat. You said that she is married? Where is her husband? I asked. Probably at home. Lots of laughter from his small audience. I wanted to leave, but at the same time I needed to stay. I took out my phone and called Charlotte. She answered and loud music started playing in the background. Hello, Andy. I can't talk now. We're busy. I heard a voice in the background that I could swear belonged to Lenny. Tell him I expect an apology. When she finished the conversation, there was laughter. Tyler Jones was the popular guy that night and spent more time talking about his exploits. He regaled his growing audience with stories of his victories. The men applauded, and the women who were listening chided him and called him super student. The men wanted to believe him, but the women mostly laughed. He claimed that after the divorce, he stopped drinking, but began practicing more often sex. In fact, his best friend started handing out stickers that said, I had sex with Tyler Johnson. These stickers were even on the walls of a couple of the women's restrooms in some of the not-so-fashionable bars in the lakeside neighborhood. This comment caught my attention. I excused myself and headed towards the lake. I headed straight to the Foggy Shore Bar. This was the bar Lenny and I were at the night, she said. I had sex with Tyler Jones. I sat down at the bar and, although I didn't need it, ordered a drink. It was already late and the place was crowded. I continued to monitor the restrooms, especially the women's ones. There was a constant stream of people coming and going in and out. Finally, the establishment began to close. Drink, Mac. Time to go home. The bartender said the same words that I repeated many times. I hesitated before speaking. I, uh, have a rather strange request. What is this? I was talking to my friend. His name is Tyler Jones. He told me that there were I had sex with Tyler Jones stickers in the women's restrooms of bars all over the area. I don't believe him, so I was wondering if they were there and if I could see for myself. He started laughing. What an asshole. His friend did it as a joke. And for a while, these stickers were all the rage. Women who had never heard of it before would come here and ask to give them to their girlfriends at wedding parties and shit like that. We still have some on the booth doors there. Come on, I'll show you. We walked to the women's restroom door, and he knocked to make sure no one was there. We walked in, and sure enough, there were stickers on each side of the doors on the four booths. I breathed a sigh of relief. If Lenny went to the bathroom while drunk, sat in one of the stalls, saw a sticker on the door, and then told me, I had sex with Tyler Jones. She was just trying to tell me what she saw. It made sense to me. Lenny had been gone for over a month. Jones said he had sex with her for the first time several months ago and that it had happened on occasion since then. It couldn't be my Lenny. Jones might be able to talk people into buying cars, but getting a happily married wife to sleep with him just to have sex? Could he do it? Sleeping with someone just to jeopardize the marriage? Could she do it? Would she do that? It must be the stickers. She saw them and wanted to tell me about it. I started to feel good. I called Lenny, but she still didn't answer. I called Charlotte. Just like the last time I called, there was loud music in the background. What do you want, Andy? Her voice sounded a little drunk. I need to talk to Lenny. She is not here. Where is she? None of your business. Is she with someone? Uh, it's none of your business either. Please ask her to call me, Charlotte. Fine. When I see her, I'll tell her. When will you see her? Probably not until tomorrow. Uh, later in the evening. Damn, I thought. I wonder if she's just tugging at my chain. 
I hope that was so. Look, tell her that if she's interested in saving this marriage, she can go to the Foggy Bank bar and use their restroom for a few minutes. What? You heard me? I thought that if she wanted to work on her marriage, she could go there that night. On the other hand, if she was with someone? It was almost noon the next day when my phone rang. It was Lenny. I didn't respond to it, but I read the message she left. I saw the stickers. I know what happened. Call me, please. I turned it off and never turned it on again. She hasn't spoken to me in weeks, so now it's my turn. I knew she still had the key to our apartment, so I slept in the back of the bar that night. I ignored her calls like she ignored mine, but it hurt. I wanted to see her and hold her and tell her I loved her, but I also wanted her to suffer a little. The next day I was standing at the bar when I heard a familiar voice ordering drinks. I turned around and saw Lenny in her work uniform. I looked at her. She reached into her apron pocket, pulled out something, and pinned it to her uniform shirt. I want to have sex with Andy Buckles, the sticker read. She must have worked quickly to write it in such a short time. She carried it for the rest of the night and endured a lot of taunts, hooting, and yelling. We just smiled at each other every chance we got. Lots of people, men and women, cheered me on. Go for it, Andy, or lucky bastard, or need some help, Andy. More than one guy introduced himself to her as Andy Buckles. Towards the end of the evening, the crowd thinned out. Some of the staff began cleaning the establishment. Lenny and I made eye contact. I finished drying my hands with the bar towel and we walked towards each other and met on the dance floor. Another couple was dancing, if you can call the contact of bodies dance. I'm sorry, I said, when we were just a few centimeters from each other. I reached over and peeled the sticker off her apron, looked at it, smiled, and put it in my pocket. Me too, she said. Do you want to dance? With pleasure. We danced for a couple of minutes. Her familiar curvies and bulges felt good on my body, and I began to get aroused for the first time since I saw Vicky Hairstone. When are you going to fix this sticker? I asked Ed, clinging to her. She cupped both sides of my face and kissed me, deeply and tenderly, all the while pressing back. As soon as you take me home and undress me. Then I heard a familiar voice. Here she is. Here's my girl. Here comes Andy. Are you trying to steal my girl, Andy? Lenny and I separated and just looked at each other. Her eyes were huge. I take it you know him? I asked her. She didn't answer. Tyler Jones grabbed her, pulled her towards him, and kissed her. After the kiss, he held her at arm's length. I could see her eyes and they were full of panic and fear as she looked at me. How soon can you get out of here, baby? He asked quietly, but still loud enough for me and other people near us to hear. I need you. She stepped towards me. Andy? I... I raised my hand to stop her. Andy, please. What's happening? Tyler Jones asked, approaching Lenny. Get away from me. She pushed him away and came up to me. Andy, it only happened once. Please, talk to me. What do you mean, one time? Jones asked. It's been at least six, and why the fuck are you telling Andy this? Let's go. Leave me alone. I spoke. So this is the waitress you told me about. Best lover you've ever had. That's her, buddy. Now she wants to act arrogant. She wasn't like that at all when she satisfied me. I couldn't stop looking at Lenny. After Jones's last statement, she simply collapsed to the floor. At the place where she and I worked, in front of our colleagues and visitors, Jones announced that he had sex with her. It was almost unbearably awkward for everyone except, obviously, Jones. He approached her. You are walking? She shook her head. Well, to hell with you. You can have her, Andy. She's good, but not that good. No, take it. I don't need her anymore. More? Did you sleep with her too? Yes. More than three years. She is my wife, but not for long. Your wife? Holy crap. I've never seen anyone move so fast in my life. I shouted after him. Hey, come back and get her. Now she's yours. To hell with it. I don't want her. Jill, the night manager, approached her. I think you should leave. And he motioned to two other employees to escort her. My mind was filled with visions of my wife and Jones, but at the same time it was devoid of thoughts, if that makes any sense. 
I robotically cleaned the bar, trying to cope with my emotions and experiences. Gil came up to me. Go home, get some rest. Call me when you're ready to come back. I did as he suggested. I am going home. When I went inside, I made sure to bolt the door. She wasn't going to come in to get her things until I was ready. Not even an hour had passed when I heard her turning the key in the lock. Then I heard a knock. Andy? Andy? Let me in. You're welcome, Andy. Leave. You don't live here anymore. Andy, please let me at least take some of my things. For what? You picked up your makeup when you left, and sluts like you don't need any clothes, so you're all set. I'm not a slut. Oh, that's right. These girls get paid. You were doing this for fun with someone other than your husband, so I think that makes you even worse. Her voice became louder. I am not like that. Leave. You can pick up your things tomorrow. Be here at nine, because by ten, all that's left of you will be in the dumpster. Andy, please, get your cheating ass out of here. The knock came shortly before nine the next morning. I looked through the small glass in the door. I didn't see Lenny, but I saw Charlotte. I opened the door. What do you need? I came to pick up Lenny's things. I pointed to several trash bags that I had filled with her things. Here they are. She can choose the furniture as she pleases, or it will be removed from here in an hour. She can't do this. Why not? She is ill. Are you sick? What's her problem? Not enough sex? Come on, Andy. She drank a whole bottle of vodka last night, and she's in bad shape. Is she in bad shape? How do I look, Charlotte? And you... Her best friend... You helped her get laid. For what? For whom? The smooth-talking bastard who described in detail to the audience how he had it. Then he comes to her work and declares in front of her husband and about a dozen other witnesses that he needs some affection from her. Yes. She's really sick, and you too. Now take her shit and get out. She began to carry the bags to the door. And you can tell her that I want my grandmother's ring back. Three days later... Half of our furniture was gone. I put everything she liked, including our bed, on the curb for everyone to pick up. I had no idea if she was making out with Jones or someone else on the bed, so I got rid of it. Then there was a knock on the door. I looked back, and it was Lenny. I let her in. What is wrong with you? She asked. Down there, people are taking my furniture. This is not your furniture. You left this apartment, leaving me and the furniture so you no longer have rights to it, and give me my grandmother's ring. You gave it to me. It's mine. Give it to me, or I'll rip your fucking finger off and take it. It is intended for the woman who will forever be my wife, not for some cheating cheater who could be talked into sleeping with some jerk from the bar. Now give it to me. She began to back away towards the door and at the same time pull off the ring. I would never hurt her but I was angry. She took it off and threw it on the floor. I picked it up and put it in my pocket. I thought we could talk about everything, she said. No way. Go talk to Tyler Jones. He's a good conversationalist. He persuaded you to sleep with him. Was he the only one who could persuade you to cheat? Or were there others? Now she stood with her back to the door and slid down until she was on the floor, and the tears flowed. I just wanted to have a little fun, Andy. He walked up to the bar and started talking to me. You were there the first couple of times, but there were so many visitors that you didn't notice him. After a few visits, he offered to buy me a drink elsewhere. You worked at night, and I met him. He had the gift of gab, and soon he started playing with my breasts. You know how I feel when you pinch me for them. Well, he pinched them, and I went crazy. Then he touched me with his finger. He did it on the dance floor. God, it was hot. Are you saying that anyone who gets close enough to you to pinch your breasts can have sex with you? No, but who are you? What happened to my wife? Charlotte said, oh, never mind. Charlotte said what? She sleeps with a lot of guys. Every time we meet, she tries to persuade me. She says, you are an asshole and don't want me to have fun. Did she tell you that she's been trying to get me into bed since I've known you? I told you to stay away from her. She is my best friend. She cares about me. Taking care of you used to be my job. 
How many guys has she set you up with? I'm guessing you picked up Jones yourself. Now. How many guys did she set you up with? Please. Two? Five? Ten? More than ten? I... Forget it. I do not want to know. You need to leave. She slowly rose to her feet. Can I at least walk around and see if there's anything else of mine there? I can assure you, nothing in this apartment is yours. What about the ownership of my car? It's in one of the bags Charlotte took, along with your photos, except for our wedding album. I threw it away. She stood in front of the door. I pulled it away, opened it, and pointed to the exit. She looked at me. Andy, please? Get out. Her head was down and she was crying when she entered the hall. I closed the door to our marriage. I went back to work. It was hard to look at the dance floor where our confrontation took place. Gil, the night manager, was sitting at the bar. I gave him a glass of ice water. You know, Andy, we own a bar and restaurant at the Capitol International Hotel downtown. It's called Oriskany. There is also live piano music every evening and a small dance floor. If you want, we can transfer you there. It's more upscale than here and they pay better. Besides, it will allow you to leave here. Three days later, I was at my new bar. I met with the day manager and she introduced me to the staff before we opened for the day. I had to start working for a few days. The days meant we got there at 10 a.m., got the place ready, opened the doors at 11 and worked until 7 p.m. The night shift started at 7 and worked until closing, which was usually 2 a.m., but sometimes lasted a little longer. The International Hotel was very upscale and I loved being there. The day before I started my new job, I initiated divorce proceedings and decided to stop shaving and grow a beard. Lenny and I didn't have much. In fact, when I went online to check our bank account, more than half of the money was gone. Lenny got advice from someone, probably Charlotte. Oh well, the court would have given it to her anyway. Then I did the usual things like credit card. I say card because we only had one. I canceled it and applied for a new account. Until I received the card, I could only use cash. The phones were in her name, so I opened my account for that too. She was served at Charlotte's. I have no idea how she reacted. One day it dawned on me that Jones said he had slept with Lenny at least six times. This meant that I had sex with her after he and God knows how many others had been inside her. I needed to see a doctor. I didn't have any symptoms. But at the time, I had no idea what the symptoms of sexually transmitted diseases were or what their incubation period was. The results sucked. Gonorrhea. Fucking syphilis. I wanted to kill her. I already said I would never hurt her. But when I heard I had syphilis, all bets were off. I could easily strangle her. Not to mention that creep Jones. I could never blame a man or woman for wanting more sex but actively seeking out married women or men is absolutely reprehensible. You have to be a certain type of trash to do that, and then to be so careless as to infect them was beyond praise. I started calling Lenny and telling her how I felt about her contracting syphilis, but why bother? A few days later, her brother knocked on my door. I just returned from vaccinations against sexually transmitted diseases. I let him in. You son of a bitch! You cheated on my sister and now she has one of those sexy things. I must kill you. There was murder in his eyes and he scared the crap out of me. Hey, Tiger, I said, stepping away from him. If you are talking about sexually transmitted diseases, then everything is the other way around. Your sister cheated on me with at least one guy. She infected me. It's a lie. She said you will say so. I'm going to kick your ass. He walked towards me and I started backing away again. But there was really nowhere to go. Well, I said as calmly as I could, before you do that, there are a dozen or more witnesses who heard the man say he had sex with her at least six times, and she didn't deny it. Then she told me that she did it for fun. Just for fun, Jimmy. She cheated on me with a worthless son of a bitch. For fun. And Charlotte helped her. Helped her, damn it. Cheered her up. He looked like he had calmed down. Jimmy had some problems in his life. He had served time in prison for assault so I knew he wouldn't hesitate to beat me to a pulp. I know you have no reason to believe me over your sister, but you know me. And you know that I'm not a liar, and I'm certainly not a traitor, 
The guy you need to talk to is Tyler Jones. I told him where Jones worked. And if you have any influence over your sister, you will try to take her away from Charlotte. I tried for years, but she didn't listen to me. He looked at me intently, not wanting to believe me. But after a few seconds, he turned and left. Four days later, I read in a newspaper left on the bar that a potential car buyer was test driving a new car from a local dealership. He was accompanied by salesman Tyler Jones. A potential buyer stopped the car, saying he heard a noise. Both he and Jones got out of the car, where he beat Jones almost to death. He left Jones on the side of the road and returned the car to the dealership. The newspaper quoted police as saying, Mr. Jones was a local Casanova who was known to be responsible for several marriage breakdowns over the past couple of years. Blood tests showed that he had several different sexually transmitted diseases, including syphilis and gonorrhea. Keep it up, Jimmy. And whoever infected Jones with these diseases, I thought, reading the article and laughing. I wondered how many of them Lenny had. The same newspaper reported that the trailer belonging to Miss Charlotte Williams was completely destroyed by fire. The trailer was not insured and was a total loss. One of these days, I'm going to have a serious talk with Jimmy about his anger management issues. Then I'm going to buy him a couple of drinks. The thought flashed through my mind about where Charlotte would live now and whether Lenny was going to move in with her. Then I realized that I didn't care. I expected the police to question Joni's, and I was questioned, but nothing ever came of it. I got the impression that finding whoever beat him up was about the same priority as chasing down pedestrians on the street. As time passed, I liked my new haircut more and more. I also liked my new beard. At first I messed it up a little, but decided to trim it. After I did this, I received many comments from my clients. I also liked the fact that my divorce was final. Apparently, when Lenny received the papers, she signed them and sent them back. She didn't bother to show up in court the day the case went before the judge. My antibiotic shots did their job and I was declared disease-free, but communication never seemed to appear on my radar screen. It was also time for my lease to expire, so I found an apartment closer to work. I didn't replace most of the furniture I threw away, but I did buy a new bed. My new apartment was so small that the king-size bed took up most of the bedroom and was difficult to carry up three flights of stairs. Luckily, I had friends who helped me, one of them, Georgie Patterson, I was friends with for a long time. We grew up in the same area, as did Lenny, Charlotte, and several other friends. When I called and asked if he could help me move, he showed up with his friend. Bryce, that was his name. And when Georgie introduced us, Bryce said, Andy Buckles? Are you Andy Buckles? I, holy shit. I know your wife. My ex-wife, I corrected him. Did you sleep with her too? I, hell no. But I'm married to Charlotte's cousin and of course I've heard your name mentioned. He didn't really like Charlotte and he began to fill me in on the events around her. He told me that after Charlotte's trailer burned down, he and Lenny rented a furnished house in the same trailer park. He told me that the couple of times he was around Charlotte and Lenny together, Lenny was inconsistent in her comments about me. When she was sober, I was a complete jerk. But when she drank a little, there was a lot of crying and thinking about how to get me back. Charlotte kept telling her that I didn't deserve her, but, again, it was when she was drunk that Lenny defended me and admitted that it was all her fault. Another tidbit he shared was that both Lenny and Charlotte blamed me for what happened to Jones. I asked him if Jones had visited them yet. Nope, he said. I think he called Lenny a couple of times before he got his ass kicked, but she wasn't interested. He also told me that Lenny worked as a waitress and gave me the name of the place. On my next day off, I went there. I walked in looked around and saw that she was waiting tables. With my new beard, I thought she wouldn't recognize me. She moved from table to table as efficiently as ever and joked openly with her customers. Twice I saw her pull her hands away from her ass, something she had to do practically her entire life as a bar waitress. I could also see and hear her joking with them while either she or they were talking, but the minute she turned away from them, the smile disappeared and a slight sadness appeared on her face. The smile returned the second she started chatting with another customer. I had no idea why I was there watching her, 
so I left. I was working the night shift when Lenny came in and she was with a man. She looked like she had lost a few pounds. As far as I knew, she had no idea that I worked there. I took a piece of paper from under the counter and wrote a note. I don't know if you know, but the woman you're with cheated on her husband and gave him a sexually transmitted disease. Proceed at your own risk. From time to time, I left the counter and went to where I could see the dining area of the restaurant. Between the salad and the entree, I saw Lenny excuse herself and go into the ladies' room. I folded my note and walked over to their table. Sorry, sir, I said, but someone gave it to me so that I could give it to you. I handed him a note. By the time I returned to the bar, he was already leaving the restaurant. I walked back to where I could see their table. I watched as Lenny sat up and took the note that her beau had placed where she could see it. She seemed to read it, crumpled it up, stood up and walked out. She walked three meters away from me and didn't recognize me, but I could see tears in her eyes. Their waitress stood at their table with their entrees, not knowing what to do with them. I approached her. They're both gone, but I know where you can send their bill. Part of me enjoyed writing the note and seeing the results, but another part of me thought it was a cheap trick that only an asshole would do. I didn't think I'd ever do it again. Once was enough. The call came two days later. It was Lenny. I know it was you. Do you know who I was? You sent a note. I lied. I have no idea what you're talking about. Gotta be you. Damn it, what are you talking about? Every time I get a new job, someone calls and says, I have an STD and they fire me. Whenever I date a guy, someone tells him that I'm a cheater and that I have an STD. What exactly does this have to do with me? It's you. I know it's you. I know you hate me, but please, I'm begging you, please stop this. I need to work. I need a job. You're welcome, Andy. Why do you think it's me? I haven't talked to you, so I have no idea where you work, so you're barking up the wrong tree. This is probably Tyler Jones trying to get even with you for not sleeping with him anymore. Or are you sleeping? Are you still sleeping with him? He said you were the best he'd ever had, which makes me think he didn't have much. Because, as far as I was concerned, you were always kind of mediocre. No, I don't sleep with him. And that's also because of you. She said that she would still sleep with him if he was able to. I caused what? You beat him up and now he'll never be able to have sex again. Oh, this is very bad. I said with all the sarcasm I was capable of. Maybe you can find someone else to infect you with diseases. Or you can infect them like you infected me. Fuck you. And she hung up. I laughed. I did send one note to her dinner companion, but I didn't send any others. Perhaps it was Jones. He may have been retaliating, but I would think he would most likely try to get revenge on the person who beat him up. And if I were him, I would think it was me, not her. Three days later, the couple arrived. They were well-dressed, like professionals. They had dinner at a restaurant, then went to a bar to have a drink and listen to music. Their waitress brought them their first round of drinks while the woman was in the ladies' room. I watched as the man added something to her drink, then picked it up and turned it over in his hands. I walked up to the table. Sorry, but I mixed the wrong drinks. It's my mistake, so I'll replace them. I took both glasses, took them behind the counter, and set them aside. I mixed two identical drinks and waited for the woman to return before serving them. I then called the manager over and told her what I had done. She called the police. The couple finished their drinks, and the man ordered another. Two police officers entered through the back door and went straight to the manager's office. The manager pointed one of our security cameras directly at this table. I personally delivered the drinks. A couple of minutes later, the woman approached the pianist and made a request. The camera recorded a man throwing something into a woman's drink while she was talking to the pianist. As soon as it hit the glass, two policemen came out and took him to the office. They also took away the drink I had placed behind the counter. They asked the lady to follow them into the manager's office. Then they all went out the back door. Two days later, I was ready to start work. It was just before seven in the evening. I was in the staff locker room putting on my official work shirt, bow tie, and vest when the manager told me someone was waiting for me. She sat at the far end of the bar alone. 
She had been there since 5 p.m. and was drinking iced tea, he said. Oh, great, I thought. Lenny is back. I walked out and stood behind the counter. The day shift bartender tapped me on the shoulder and jerked his head towards the woman. I looked, and it wasn't Lenny. I didn't know who she was. I took a towel from the bar, dried my hands, threw it over my shoulder where I usually keep it, and walked over to her. Hi, I said as casually as I could. I'm Andy. I understand you were waiting for me. She smiled. Yes, it is. My name is Dana Alexander, and I know I owe you a thank you. For what? For saving me from the scumbag who tried to give me Rohypnol. Not once, but twice. Oh, I didn't recognize you? Are you okay? Yes, thank you. If it weren't for you, I would be in real trouble. It didn't mean anything, bastard. Uh, uh, people like this should be in jail. Well, he is like that, or was like that until he was released on bail. I'm guessing your husband wouldn't need a date rape drug, so he must be the boyfriend. God, no, she said. He's a colleague, or was. He was fired when the company found out what he had done. Have you two been dating for a long time? No, this was the first time. He was such a nice guy at work. He was hired six months ago, but only started harassing me two weeks ago. I have a rule that I never date my co-workers, but it wore me down. Did you have any indication that he was going to try to drug you with some kind of substance? No, the dinner was wonderful and he behaved like a true gentleman. He was just like the office guy, funny and intelligent. Not to mention I thought he looked really good. Well, it's all over now. Not really, she said. We still have to meet him in court. We? She laughed. Yes, we are. You can rest assured that you will be called as a witness. I didn't think about it. It's okay. The chance of putting such an asshole in jail is not a problem for me. Dana Alexander sat at the bar for a long time before leaving, and we talked at every opportunity between customers. I discovered that she and the asshole who tried to drug her were both architects. If I could go to college, this is where I would want to go. She thanked me again and said goodbye saying that she would see me again. A couple of days after this, an employee from the district attorney's office visited me. He wanted to discuss my appearance at the asshole's trial. Over the next few weeks, I had several meetings with him and other members of the DA staff. I never saw Dana Alexander. In the meantime, I met a couple of women who became my regular sexual partners. There is nothing better in the world than having sex. I enjoyed the company of both of them for about three months. There were no claims to exclusivity. For all of us, it was sex for pleasure. If I spent the night with one, the other was fine with it because she knew the next night was hers. One evening, they were sitting together at a bar when a woman and two men walked in. The three of them sat down at a table and drank and danced for a couple of hours. They were free in their feelings because she kissed them both equally. My two girls, Judy and Anna, did their fair share of dances when asked. In between dances, a lot of our attention was focused on the trio. It was Judy who first mentioned the old movie, Paint Your Wagon, in which the woman had two husbands, so she saw nothing wrong with what the three were doing. Anna then suggested that it would be funny to have two men at the same time. How about it, Andy? Would you agree to a threesome? Judy asked me, I loft. Depends on whether there are three of us. I said and walked away to serve the client. When I returned to the girls, they were whispering. They stopped as I approached. What do you mean? Depends on the threesome? Asked Anna. Well, participating in boy-boy girl sex is not on my bucket list. However, just at that moment, I walked away to help another client and stayed to chat with him for a couple of minutes. We were interrupted by Judy slamming her glass on the counter. How about we do a little service here? she said, laughing. I grinned, took the towel off my shoulder and sauntered back to them, wiping the counter as I went. They had been sitting on their bar stools when I left, but now they were both leaning over the counter, trying to get as close to me as possible. As I approached them, Judy whispered, However what? I chuckled again and leaned closer to both of them. However, I don't know a single purebred man who would turn down the opportunity to have a threesome with two women, I whispered back. 
They looked at me, then at each other, then leaned back in their chairs together. Girls, would you like another drink? I'll treat you, I said. They refused, saying they needed to leave. I was busy for the rest of my shift. It was already three o'clock in the morning when I returned home. I took a shower and, still drying myself, headed to my bedroom and went to bed. I had just thrown the towel on the floor and was ready to jump into bed when someone knocked on my door. I took a towel, wrapped it around my waist, and opened the door. We brought some snacks, Anna said, as she walked past me with Judy right behind her. They had both been to my apartment before and had actually spent the night on different occasions. Yes, we thought you might be hungry, Judy giggled. I looked from one to the other, and they seemed hot, smoking. Where's the food? Who said anything about food? asked Anna. You said. No, I said we brought something to eat. There is a difference. Yes, Judy said as she began to unbutton her blouse. She was unbuttoned and had no bra on. I had seen her breasts before, but as always the sight of any bare breasts usually makes any man aroused. She took off her blouse and kissed me, softly and tenderly. Hey, this is convenient, Anna laughed and pointed to my towel. Looks like he was waiting for us, Judy said. Anna brought her lips as close to mine as she could without actually touching them, and sighed rather than spoke. Is that all, Andy? Were you waiting for us? She then kissed me while reaching down to loosen my towel and let it fall to the floor. My knees buckled. Judy stood on one side of me and Anna stood on the other. They took my hands and led me backwards to my bedroom. I felt my legs hit the edge of the bed and they pushed me down to where I was sitting. Judy finished taking off her blouse. Anna was wearing a shirt and pulled it over her head. She was also without a bra. It was the perfect threesome. The rest of the night was absolute heaven. The double bed, which I thought was too big, turned out to be perfect. The three of us were together for about three months, but then Judy went on a cruise with some of her sorority sisters and came back smitten with one of the ship's junior officers. Anna, on the other hand, received a promotion in her company and was transferred to Phoenix. I was going to miss them, but at the same time I was relieved. I needed some rest. The girls and I had been together for a couple of months when the trial of a guy who attempted date rape began. I testified as a witness for the prosecution, and the bastard got five years in prison. The trial lasted only one day. I saw Dana Alexander there, and we talked briefly. One evening, Bryce walked into a bar. He laughed and told me that Lenny and Charlotte's friendship was over. One evening, they both got drunk and started arguing. Lenny accused Charlotte of leading her into temptation and causing the divorce. Charlotte responded by accusing Lenny of being a slut which I thought was an example of the pot calling the kettle. Charlotte eventually left in a drunken stupor, got into her car, and, less than a block away, crashed into another car, crashed through a fence, and crashed into a house. She crashed her uninsured car. She was sentenced to six months in prison for drunk driving, driving without insurance, and leaving the scene of an accident. She also lost her license for a year. I told Bryce that I was no longer interested in hearing about Lenny or Charlotte and that I considered that part of my life closed. I was promoted at work today, manager, so I no longer work nights except to cover for the night manager when she has a day off. She did the same for me. One Wednesday night we had a particularly busy crowd, so we were extremely busy. We love being in the restaurant and bar business. This means people eat and drink. I was sitting at the far end of the bar with a glass of ice water when I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned around and saw Dana Alexander. I stood up and turned to her. Good evening, I said. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you? Pretty good, thank you. What can I do for you? Nothing. Is it true? We just stopped by for dinner and I thought I'd say hello. Fine. Enjoy. I watched as she joined the couple and the three of them entered the restaurant. Later that evening, I helped a woman get her husband out the door and into a taxi after he had had too much to drink. I made a mental note to remind myself to talk to our servers about keeping an eye on our guests. I watched the taxi pull away, turned to go back inside, and almost collided with Dana. I was looking for you, she said. I'm here. I see it. Still looking out for people, I see. 
It's just part of the job, I said in an exaggerated Texas accent. Look, I don't want to seem pushy, and to be honest, I've never done this before, but would you be interested in having a drink with me sometime? She quickly added. As a thank you, I just looked at her. Of all the things I could have expected, asking Dana Alexander out was never on my radar. Uh, I'm sorry. I put you in an awkward position. You are either married or in a relationship. So please excuse me. She was about to leave. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I grabbed her hand and turned her to face me. I'm not married and I don't have a relationship. It's just that no beautiful woman had ever asked me out on a date before. And I was, actually, I'm still in shock. I'd love to have a drink with you. She smiled. Great. How about Friday? Or are you working? Friday will be perfect. What time and where should I pick you up? Well, since I asked you, I'll pick you up at 7. Just tell me where. I gave her my address. I was ready at 7 when she pulled up. I had no idea what to wear, and for the first time in my life I understood how a woman feels on a first date. I settled on slacks and a sports jacket with a tie. Would you mind if we moved on from drinks to dinner? She asked. I missed lunch today. Not at all. That was my answer. We went to a very nice restaurant, had dinner, danced, and she took me home. When we got there, she got out of the car as if she was going to walk me to the door. I decided that, thank you, went far enough, so I told her that she didn't need to walk me to the door. How else can I kiss you goodnight? She asked. I walked around the car on her side. I can fix this. I told her. I hugged her. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Then I kissed her, not on the cheek, but directly on the lips. She got into her car and drove away. I literally flew up the stairs to my apartment, wondering how I got so lucky. However, my good mood was short-lived when I realized that I had not received her phone number. As I usually do when undressing, I turned out all my pockets, including my jacket pockets. Reaching into the left pocket of my jacket, I pulled out a business card. It was Dana's business card, and on the back, she wrote her mobile number. She must have slipped it there during one of our dances. It was a business card, so it had the name and address of her company on it. I didn't call her over the weekend, but on Monday morning, I ordered two dozen roses to deliver to her office. At one o'clock in the afternoon, I answered the phone at the bar. Oriskany, can I help you? Not the biggest name in the world, but it was one of the best and most popular night spots in the city. The man who first opened the establishment served aboard the USS Oriskany during World War II, so he named his establishment after the ship. There was even a large model of a ship behind the counter. Is this Andy? This is true. Hello, this is Dana. I just received some beautiful roses. Thank you. You're welcome, my lady. There was a short pause before I spoke again. I was going to call you later to see if you would like to have dinner with me again. Um, I would like that. When did you mean? Well, today is Monday and Friday is usually the big date, so how about tomorrow? She laughed. I don't know where you developed your logic, but tomorrow sounds great. She gave me her address, and I asked her if seven would be convenient. It was a very nice house, in a very good area. And we spent another very pleasant evening. For the next few weeks, we met at least three times a week. I found out that she got divorced after five years of marriage because they simply fell out of love with each other. They were still good friends. In fact, she said they were better friends now than when they were married, and he now lived on the West Coast. The house she lived in was their home, and she got it in the divorce. I almost felt sorry for the poor guy paying the mortgage on a beautiful house he couldn't live in. I felt even worse the first time Dana and I made love in this house, on their bed, and we showered together in the same shower she shared with him. We were happy for about six months. We laughed and joked and met quite often, and every time we went out, I was grateful that I worked around the clock, except... As I said, when the night manager was free, as usual, I called her to see when she wanted to go out again. Sorry, Andy, but my ex is in town, and I'm going to have dinner with him. Uh, okay, certainly. Have fun. I hesitated. My first thought was that she told me that they had just fallen out of love with each other, and that they were better friends now than when we were married. I waited two days before calling her again. 
Andy, Cliff is still here and we're chatting about some things, and besides, my company has a deadline for a new building we're designing, and I need to run some numbers. I heard stories about sex with an ex and began to wonder if Dana and Cliff were having sex. I was in a quandary. I had no reason to believe that she and Cliff slept together. But I also had no reason to believe that Lenny was cheating. The difference was that Lenny and I were married, and Dana and I were not. I didn't have to like it, but she was free to sleep with whoever she wanted. Still, part of me wanted to know the truth. Part of me wanted to ask her, but the rest of me didn't want to know if she slept with him. I called her and the call went straight to voicemail. I called her office. Sorry, but Miss Alexander is unavailable. Would you like to leave a message? No. No messages. A week has passed. I was in my manager's office when I called her again. She answered. Hello? How are you? Well, we haven't spoken in over a week, and I just thought, Oh, Andy, I've been so busy. Let me ask you a question. Certainly. Is Cliff still in town? Why are you asking about this? He... Why are you worried about him? Then I just blurted it out. Are you sleeping with him? I asked. The next thing I heard was silence as she ended the call. This pretty much told me what I needed to know. I returned to the restaurant and kitchen to check on how things were going. I sulked for the rest of my shift when I got home. As usual, I emptied my pockets, undressed, and went to the shower. After my shower, I put on my robe, poured myself a gin and tonic, and sat down to watch the news. I sat down in my deep chair, leaned back, pressed the on button, on the remote control, and took a sip of his drink. Before I could do this, someone banged on my door with such force that it seemed as if it was flying off its hinges. I stood up, put down my glass, and opened the door. Miss Dana Alexander burst into the room and started. You're an idiot. You are an insensitive idiot. I'm a single woman over 21 years old, and I can damn well do whatever I want. No insecure asshole is going to change that. If I want to sleep with my ex-husband and 20 other men, that's my right. Just like it's your right to do the same. I... She took a deep breath. The point is, you can't tell me who to sleep with. Just like I can't tell you who to sleep with. I didn't want to sleep with anyone but you. Did you want to? What do you mean, didn't want to? Don't you want it now? Not if you slept with your ex-husband and 20 others. Damn it. I'm not going to sleep with anyone but you. That's what I was trying to tell you. Then where have you been for more than a week? I was working. Our construction plans are behind schedule and we will be fined if we don't make it. You didn't have time for me, but you had time for Cliff. We were working on a deal to buy my house. He's getting married again and can't afford to pay for two houses, so he wanted to know if I'd take over the payments and buy it. I didn't have to do this because the divorce gave me that right, but I saw no reason to keep harassing him and I can afford it. So we made a deal where I would pay the mortgage and he would pay a certain amount each month until it is paid. Everything is quite civilized. As I already told you, he and I are still friends. We just fell out of love with each other. Where did he stay? With you? Are you going to be this jealous for the rest of our lives? Yes. Where did he stay? With my sister about four kilometers from my house. And you never slept with him? This is a stupid question. Of course I slept with him. He was my husband. She gave me back some of my sarcasm. I mean, while he was here this time. Are you not listening? No, I didn't sleep with him. What about 20 other guys? Jerk. Pour me a drink? Then take off your clothes and I'll show you who I'm sleeping with. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.